all, we want to welcome everyone uh, tonight to the final Freedom School of the semester sponsored by the Africana Studies Department here at Georgia State University. Uh, we want to definitely thank the Audubon Library for its continued uh, collaboration and support on this Freedom School project. Uh, and we'll be back next semester, of course, with even more exciting lectures and talks. Um, I am Dr. Makungu Akinyela, an associate professor here in the Africana Studies Department. And I will be the moderator for this evening where actually we've got a pretty exciting talk going on. And I say that because as a, a mental health professional and a therapist, uh, it sounds like some really exciting um, information that we're gonna be getting tonight from our guest lecturer, Dr. Um, Sierra Carter. And let me tell you a little bit about her before she actually gets started with, with her talk. Dr. Carter is an assistant professor of clinical and community psychology at Georgia State University. Her primary area of research for the past 11 years focuses on investigating how psychosocial and contextual stressors can affect both mental and physical health outcomes for Black populations. She has a long-standing interest in the ways in which poor health outcomes in Black populations arise and are maintained by psychological, physiological, and contextual social processes. As a clinical scientist committed to enhancing clinical outcomes by attending to culturally relevant processes, a common theme throughout her work has been examining how racial discrimination as an acute and chronic stressor affects development and exacerbation of chronic illnesses and stress-related disorders across the life course. Her research takes a strength-based lens to also focus on identifying key communal and individual level factors that have been utilized by Black people in the past and present to promote optimal healing from racism and related stress trauma. So we're excited uh, to hear more about this subject of, of trauma and its impact on the health of Black communities and Black people from Dr. Sierra Carter. Dr. Carter, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, get us started with this presentation today. So um, as, pre as previously mentioned by that great introduction, I have really been, you know, interested since I was an undergrad student, but, you know, as a Black woman across my life uh, around this idea of racism as an insidious stressor. Um, and um, I hope today's talk will help us to think um, more critically, or already if you're thinking critically, just think a little bit even more about thinking about um, how addressing racial trauma or racial stress or racism generally, however you want to consider it, um, is, is uh, dire for us to really think about reaching health equity. And I think a lot of the cultural practices that Black communities have already used in our history and in our present time really help us to think about how we face this racism pandemic um, in the future. So I just want to first just give a brief background of uh, a brief overview of what I plan to talk about today. So first, I'm just going to give some brief background, um, some a couple of definitions so that we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my past and current research focuses, um, ways that I have um, studied racism as a chronic stressful stimuli, like other chronic stressors and Black lives in particular. And also just a brief understanding of health disparities linked to both racism and trauma exposure and where this conceptualization of racial trauma comes from. And then I'll talk a little bit about the intergenerational impact with an eye towards thinking about what we do about this. So if we know this information after I talk today, hopefully we can also see an eye towards strength and liberation. So how we can move towards health equity is gonna depend on the people who live through it. And I'll end with some take home points. 
So first I wanna start off by this consideration of racism as a pandemic. Um, as everyone in this audience should know, um, George Floyd's death was a precipice for um, a lot of social just justice advocacy, as well as a lot of um, civic unrest and thinking about the lives of Black people being destroyed um, because of um, systems that perpetuate oppression, as well as the historical legacies of oppression that have lasted a long time. And I like this picture because I can see and I resonate with the idea as well as the visual facts that um, racism isn't new. Uh, racism has been happening for a very long time and its effects have been long lasting. So under George Floyd, we see pictures of other people across our history here in the US who have died at the hands of police brutality, at the hands of lynching, at the hands of enslavement. Um, and this history cannot be denied in thinking about how racism across generations has had an effect on Black people's mind and body. And so that's what um, really started my area of research. When I was an undergraduate, um, I heard a talk by David Williams and um, Dr. Robert, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Robert Sellers. And they came out the gate saying, you know, Black Americans live sicker and die younger than other people. All other people, all the racial and ethnic groups. And when I was thinking that through as a Black woman, I began to think about what do we do about this? I want Black people to live long and thriving lives. That is one of my ultimate goals. And we didn't see much in the psychology world thinking about this. And I, and I began to question why. Why is mental health separated from physical health disparities that we see? And so we'll, we'll get into this in a second. Within this research that Dr. David Williams, um, as well as Robert Sellers really put forward um, in research literature with Black Americans, we know that Black people disproportionately experience cardiovascular diseases, chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension disproportionately. We also know that trauma exposure, as well as other adverse events and social toxins are currently viewed as chronic stressors that can get under our skin to affect health. So we, uh, in our current literature, a lot of our research talks about trauma um, in, its, in, its, um, in its traditional sense, meaning that we see trauma in sexual violence, we see it in car accidents, we see it in natural disasters. And these types of events over time can get under our skin and affect our body, body's regulatory systems to affect our health. That is an acknowledged thing in our research literature. What isn't as acknowledged is this concept of racism as also something that can get under our skin. Um, we know that racism is considered the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people on the grounds of race. We also know research has shown that approximately 70 to 90% of Black adults, as well as Black youth, um, as young as the age of eight, are reporting experiencing at least one incident of racial discrimination within the last year. Uh, when I was uh, in grad school, one of the things I found most interesting when I was doing a meta-analysis is a lot of our research um, in the 1990s and the, two and the 2000s around racism focused on um, black adults. We didn't focus as much on youth. Um, I think we thought uh, in a number of ways that maybe black youth are protected in some ways from the, the nature of racism, but we actually know that is not the case and research has shown that black youth are experiencing just as much uh, racism as black adults and sometimes even more. We also know that racism is multifaceted and can mean a number of different types of experiences for Black people. So it can be in vivo and vicarious. So I don't have to be the one to experience racism to feel its effects on my mind and body. So you can think about um, watching the visuals of George Floyd, Sandra Bland. Um, we can go down Ahmaud Arbery, down the list of people and seeing that and how that made you feel in your mind and body and think about that as also a form of racism. 
We also know that there is a conceptualization of racism as traumatic, and I'll get to that in a second. We also know that racism can be considered objective and subjective. So objective meaning things like hate crimes, right? Things that we hear about um, as um, extreme examples of racism, but we also know it can be subjective. So we have these terms called microaggressions where um, things are per perpetuated in ways that are demeaning to our self-worth as black people and um, to show themselves in ways where we sometimes question if it's racism, but, um, and oftentimes it is racism in ways that really also get under our skin. And racism lastly is multi-level. So it can be interpersonal, so between two people. It can also be institutional. So how systems and institutions like medical centers, carceral systems, school systems, how they perpetuate injustices that lead to health inequity that are rooted in oppression and racism. And we also know that there are systemic, systemic and structural racism that happens to Black people because of historical legacies of oppression. And that can lead to things that I'm not going to get into detail uh, a lot about today, but things like redlining, um, disproportionate um, denial of loans. Um, all of these have policies that have been put in place that are rooted in racism, that perpetuate inequities across time and even today that have long lasting effects. So um, after George Floyd, we often thought about um, a number of calls to action. There were a number of calls to action that happened around uh, racism as um, something important that we need to discuss. Um, but before George Floyd, um, we were even seeing a push from um, different organizations saying, ah, racism is important for us to consider. And not only important for us to consider, but important in our medical centers, and as well as important for children, particularly Black children. So the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2019 was saying, we're missing an important factor in thinking about the health and wellness of our Black children. Um, and racism can be the cause of a number of things that we um, often do not assess for when we think about things like tummy aches, when we think about things like attention problems, when we think about other forms of how people, how um, Black youth might act out. Um, and these are important considerations to thinking about wellness um, as well as health outcomes for youth. And so that has led to research that has also been thinking about racism in the context of trauma. And I'll briefly go over um, how trauma exists in our society. One of the things that we know is that almost 65% of Black youth report traumatic experiences compared to 30% of their peers from other races and ethnicities. And over the lifespan, Black Americans also have significantly higher rates of what we call objective life stressors, such as witnessing violence, receiving bad news, so you can think about this in the context of COVID-19, and losing a loved one prematurely in the context of COVID-19 that has disproportionately affect, affected Black people. Only recently, so within the last year, have theoretical models of early childhood adversity that primarily focus on this uh, traditional trauma that I've talked about before, um, have begun to consider how racism is a part of this picture. It's largely neglected as um, this multifaceted influence of multiple forms of traumatic stress. So recently, uh, Dr. Dante Bernard began a conceptualization and theoretical framework saying racism can serve as a unique role in explaining why Black Americans are disproportionately exposed to trauma in the first place. So if we think about the multi-level effects of racism, the chronic nature of racism from a structural level can influence how people are placed in settings that disproportionately put them in areas of harm, as well as in just areas of uh, living in poverty. So that leads me to um, this concept that is gaining a lot of traction um, of racial discrimination in and of itself as being a traumatic stressor and the term being race-based trauma. 
And this is one term where people are beginning to say that this may explain higher rates of trauma exposure in Black communities. One study that began to look at racism and its association with, with, with trauma-related symptoms found that racial discrimination was associated with 70% of trauma-related symptom outcomes. What we see in our research literature that across the board with what we call traumatic symptoms or post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, racial discrimination is related to all of them, including hyperarousal, irritability, um, sleep problems, re-experiencing symptoms, so thinking about that tra traumatic stressor again, um, negative um, self images and, and self blame, all of them are linked to symptoms that we have consistently thought of as only being related to things that are traditional traumas. Racial trauma or race-based trauma as a definition has been considered to be dangerous or frightening race-based events, stressors, or discrimination that overwhelm one's coping capacity and impacts quality of life and or causes fear, helplessness, and horror. Very similar definition as a clinician to how we think about um, things like sexual assault-based traumas um, and all other forms of trauma that are not considered to be racism-laden. And so that um, has led me to consider a lot of these events and how I study how these stressors get under our skin. So I wanted to just give a brief um, overview of kind of this biological stress process that really informs um, some of my work. There are many models of stress response, but the reason why I like McEwen's model is because as you can see, he has here the brain as well as the physiological response. It doesn't separate the mind and the body. So what he says is that when a stressor happens, our mind responds, we have thoughts, and we also have a physiological response, or so our body is responding. What you also see at the top of the screen is that there are different stressors that he identifies, including environmental stressors, major life events, as well as trauma and abuse. And what he says is these stressors over the life course can lead to physiological responses. What we know is that our body is made to adapt to stressors, right? So you can think about um, something that's just frightening. So if I, saw, if I saw something that was frightening, my body is going to respond in a way that tries to protect myself, right? So I'm gonna be on high alert, I may run, I might have to go flee, but my body is responding to that. And so my body's regulatory system is on high alert, right? It's really charged up so that I can survive. But what McEwen's model says is that um, when we're trying to reach this balance back down after we feel like we are safe, so after the stressor is gone, um, our body kind of reaches this balance back down. We calm back down, we're safe. But with chronic stressors, like the stressors that are named here, trauma, environmental stressors, major life events, if they're chronic, so not ending, then that means our body is always on high alert and our body is never able to calm down and regulate in the ways that it needs to um, in order to have this balance that our body needs. And when that happens, that is linked to disproportionate rates that we see in chronic diseases for African-Americans. That's linked to hypertension, that's linked to cardiovascular diseases, that's linked to diabetes. What you see is possibly missing uh, from this conversation is racism. And um, in 2007, May said, wait a minute, there is another stressor that we need to be thinking about. And racism is, should also be considered as a chronic stressful stimulus that when experienced can lead our mind and our body to react in a ways that can be chronically overactive for our body regulatory systems to where we're not able to reach homeostasis because of the long-standing effects that racism can have on our bodies. And that has led to a lot of my research for um, a long period of time and thinking about how racism is a chronic stressful stimulus, just like all the other ones that are mentioned in this mo model. And again, we know that racism is not a inter only an interpersonal experience. It's not just one-on-one. -on -one. 
racism is multi-level. So researchers have said, not only is it that our body regulatory systems are acting up because of these interpersonal one-on-one -on -one interactions with racism from the police or encounters with the police or encounters with other people, other white people, it's also because of the system. So when we think about concepts as well as experiences of residential segregation, socioeconomic inequality, as well as concentrated disadvantage of poverty and violence. All of these things that I think are really insidious in thinking about racism as a cause for each one of these societal traumas is linked to high allostatic load, which is also linked to the chronic diseases that I talked about before. Inflammatory disorders include things like hypertension and cardiovascular disease, as well as stroke that disproportionately affects Black people. And so we can think about all from a, a, a micro level to a macro level that racism is affecting um, the mind and body for people disproportionately, Black people, um, across time. And it's such an important factor to think of as a pandemic because it's important for um, thinking about where we're going to go to decrease the effects of racism so that Black people live longer lives. So now I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about my research that's aligned with some of these theoretical frameworks as well as previous research that I just talked about. I wanted to start off first though um, with a quote uh, for ta Coates, um, Between the World and Me, because it really influences how I think about my work. Um, so ta Coates says in his book, it struck me that perhaps the defining feature of being drafted into the black race was the inescapable robbery of time. At face value, um, this inescapable robbery of time can mean what you, know, you think about my research just broadly. So robbing time. So we have as black people less time to live as other race, racial and ethnic groups. But what he is also saying in this statement is that the inescapable robbery of time is linked to second chances. So other people who have more privilege, including white people, um, it means that for them, second chances is given. But for black people, these second opportunities, the ability to come back from something that happens to you, the ability to move forward when you make a mistake is robbed from black people. And in dissimilar ways from other racial and ethnic groups to uh, allow them the space and time to be able to come back from, di to, from disadvantage. And I think that's an important quality of thinking about um, as a clinical psychology, what that does to the mind when you feel like things might lose hope, right? You feel like you're living in a situation where you're not even allowed to learn and grow in some ways to in escape the, the nature of racism. This robbery of space and time has a, a really, imp really important impact on the lives of Black people. And I think that's important to think about um, as we move to some of the research that I'm doing. I wanted to start off first uh, with a paper um, that I published um, in health psychology, um, thinking about the effects of early life experiences of racism by Black youth at the age of 10. Um, and we followed them um, through the age of 29. As I mentioned before, um, at the time that I did this research, there wasn't a lot of research thinking that Black youth were experiencing a lot of racism. Um, so we wanted to see um, if there was a link between racism experienced at age 10 by Black youth and this accelerated biological aging. So this accelerated aging is a marker um, and it's linked to disease processes and sometimes linked to early, early life death. And so it's, it's uh, collected through blood draws. And what we understand is this accelerated aging process is saying your biological clock is different from your chronological clock. So you're accelerating in your aging pace um, linked to something else. And in this case, what we found that is that racism that Black youth were reporting at age 10 was highly related to accelerated aging biological processes at age 29. Um, so this is a high link. 
But one of the things that I did um, as a clinical psychologist when I was finding this, I was like, I wonder what is driving um, this effect. And in thinking that the mind and body are not separated from each other, what we found is that the mechanism, a significant mechanism influencing the relationship between racial discrimination early in life and accelerated biological aging later in life was what was driving it was depression. And what does that mean? I think it's an important consideration and um, a potential point of thinking about interventions, um, both as a clinician, but also broader for society. Because what happens after we experience racism? Um, there, like in McEwen's model that I mentioned before, is not only a get under the skin process, but it's also a mental process, right? If I continuously experience racism throughout my life, some of the symptoms of depression, including hopelessness, loss of energy, um, loss of interest in things that you used to enjoy, can make sense over time, and especially in the context of where people may live and how they might live their lives. And so one of the ways that we're thinking about depression is that we do understand um, a lot about how depression works and how we can think about treatments as clinicians. But we also think that when we know that racism is a, a, a chronic stressor that's affecting accelerated aging, then that means that the cause of some of these mental health issues that we're saying is not the individual's burden to bear, but it's a societal ill. And when it's a societal ill, then there needs to be societal, just, societal justice to account for what's happening to people's bodies because of social unrest, um, because of social injustice. And so a lot of these findings, I think, inform how we need to consider political action, resistance, and thinking about policies that can influence um, the deter influence how we think about racism, as well as influencing diminishing the amount of racism that Black people face. Another um, space that I have moved in. So I, I started with this kind of lifespan um, discussion of how racism can affect health. So racism early in life, how that can affect um, accelerated aging processes across time into adulthood. But then I started to wonder, how far back does racism work? And for who does it work? And so one of the things that I found the most interesting when I was an undergrad was this statistic. So babies born to college educated black women are still more likely to have a lower birth weight than babies born to white women who dropped out of high school. We know that maternal morbidity and mortality among Black women is the highest, among the highest rates of inequity. And in particular, this form of health disparity is not explained by social economic status. So a lot of times when I talk about racism, a lot of people tell me, but what about poverty? Like poverty is the real reason, not racism for why um, people experience health outcomes because of different forms of stressors. And I tell them this in particular, but we also know that racism separate from socioeconomic status influences health. But this uh, health disparity in particular shines bright when we think about racism um, because we see that particularly middle-aged, uh, well not, um, people with higher SES, Black women, are also likely to have, just as likely to have maternal health issues and maternal morbidity issues. So it's not necessarily linked um, to socioeconomic status. And people have begun to question, what is the real reason for maternal morbidity and high maternal low birth weights for babies um, born to Black women? And so that led me to do um, with some colleagues at the University of Utah to do kind of a deep dive into understanding the biological embedding of chronic stress across generations within marginalized communities. We did a review of the literature. One of the things that was sad, but was also very telling about our research literature in this area is that we only saw 11 studies total across time that mentioned racism as a chronic stressor that could be affecting 
um, these disproportionate rates of um, health inequity and maternal morbidity for black and brown populations. We thought that was this crazy. We know that, the, that these things exist. We know that this is a high, um, a high disparity. And we couldn't understand why there are so few studies. But we wanted to also think about the ways in which racism could be affecting um, the process, not only for the Black mom, but also for her fetus, as well as her growing baby. And so we created a diagram that outlines how we think racism works um, to affect prenatally Black mothers, their fetus, Black, Black babies. One of the most interesting things I think about with this diagram, and I'll go into a little bit of detail in a second, is that um, one of the, the hardest parts for me to think about when I think about maternal health is even before a baby is born, racism can be having an effect on the body, right? And I think that's an important thing to think about when we think about how longstanding racism can have an impact on Black people's health. Even before I come into the world, my parents' experiences of racism can have an effect on my body and my well-being. I think that in itself relates to how we need to think about public policy and how we need to think about reaching health equity. In this drawing, we started with the prenatal stage and thinking about Black women and the things that they face um, and multi-level um, space and multi-level language. So not only is it individual racism, racial trauma, racial profiling for Black women, also obstetric racism, which I'm going to talk about here in a second with some of the focus groups I've done. We also see it um, at community levels. So exposure to hate crimes, exposure to racially motivated violence. We also see it at the structural level, including historical trauma, segregation, poor quality of education, inequitable access to health care, as well as poverty. We think that racism is not separate from the conversation of poverty. We think poverty is under the umbrella of racism because of the things I mentioned previously. We also think that when the baby is born, um, there is, or is being born, um, there is incre increased risk for poor birth outcomes, such as preterm pre birth and low birth weight because of these racism related stressors, increased risk from return to mortality. Um, and we also know in the process of having um, a child, there are discriminatory hospital practices that occur. All of these experiences can affect um, the baby, including altering their physiological responses to stress, lowering heart rate variability, which is linked to how our body is not able to reach that balance, right? Greater cortisol reactivity. So that means we have a greater stress response when there are high levels of this chronic stressor where our body is on high alert, even as um, a newborn baby. And it's similar to how we think about other chronic stressors and their effects. It's just in our literature, we haven't discussed racism. And I think that's an important conversation that I continue to want to move forward and thinking about how these intergenerational impacts and not just my own individual experience, but the history of racism can impact me now, can impact my future, and can impact the future of my generations. And so this intergenerational or transgenerational effect of racism and trauma has a really important impact on the health and wellness of Black people. Another thing that I think is important um, to this conversation as, as I continue to study intergenerational impact um, is this concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome. So one of the things when I go to a lot of trauma conferences is we talk a ton about the Holocaust. I feel like even when I was in grade school or when I was in middle or elementary school, we talked a lot about the Holocaust and what happened. And one of the things we do at these research conferences is we talk about with the Holocaust, how generations later are experiencing the effects of the Holocaust. So we, we know that offspring of people who um, were in internment camps 
those children that are a part of that generation have higher levels of anxiety, higher rates of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, that is linked to these experiences. But nowhere in these conferences do we talk about enslavement, but um, there is this construct of post-traumatic slave syndrome by Degro that argues that this not only is an important thing to consider, um, enslavement, but that its effects also have an effect on how we think about parenting as Black, as black, as black people, how we think about our self-esteem, how we think about our wellness, as well as how we, how we experience our health. So she argues that decreased self-esteem, ever-present anger, and racist socialization are the psychological markers for post-traumatic stress syndrome and explain intergenerational family discord and the numerous disparities in health outcomes. One example that she gives is this uh, parent pass down of that Black people have to work twice as hard um, to get as far as white people do. And she, she began to discuss, where does this come from? Where does this pass down discussion come from? And she, she believes that it comes from enslavement and thinking about what the nature of enslavement did to the mind for Black people about what it means to get through and get by. And that that has an effect across generations because racism has continued to follow us as a pandemic across time. And so now I'm gonna move into thinking about and understanding experiences of racial trauma among Black Americans from a perspective of, we have to understand our history in order to move forward. So building a historical consciousness. And in the work that I do with biological embedding, I really have a, um, thought about why this area of historical consciousness is so important. Understanding the historical legacies of racism is really important to thinking about how we move forward. And so in the, a paper that I uh, recently wrote that is uh, about to come out um, uh, this month, I think, um, I wrote this for a special issue article um, and thinking about how we study um, different forms of stressors, but I focus on racial trauma across the lifespan um, among Black Americans. But I start off this article by first this denoting um, a quote from uh, Angela Davis that says, if we do not know how to meaningfully talk about racism, our actions will move in misleading directions. And when I was writing this paper, one of the things that I began to think about and thinking about things like accelerated aging processes, physiological markers of inflammation that we see amongst Black people, is that in order to survive in systems of oppression, Black people have had to move in many ways of adaptation. And our science doesn't really catch up to the ways that Black people have moved, have thrived, have struggled, and the experiences of racism across time. And I really think that's important to kind of thinking as an interdisciplinary scientist, as well as a clinician, about how we approach healing for this population. So I wanted to just give you, we have more data now, but I just wanted to give you an idea of why it's so important to know how racism works, to have this historical consciousness. Um, and some research, recent work we do, we usually, um, what I saw in the research before we're doing a study, so we usually talk about interpersonal racism. A lot of our measures of racial discrimination that we provide to people for Black people to self-report have to do a lot with what we call individual racism or interpersonal racism. So this one-on-one -on -one racism. But we know racism is not only about these one-on-one -on -one experiences. It's, mo it's much more multifaceted than that. So one of the things that we're um, beginning to look at uh, in link to trauma symptoms, including hyperarousal symptoms, so how much you're hyped up, intrusive symptoms, how much racism experiences are affecting um, getting into your mind and like and can ruin your day, um, as well as uh, avoidance and numbing symptoms. So the actions that I have to take to really get this out of my mind, avoid certain places and things, what we find is that one of the things that is sticking out is cultural racism. 
cultural racism, I wanted to put down below so you can read one of the items from the scale, is uh, really getting at what we think about with how Black people experience the collective toll of racism, even if they didn't experience it themselves. So one of the items uh, for cultural racism is that you notice that when Black people are killed by the police, the media influence the public of the victim's criminal record or negative information in their background, suggesting they got what they deserved. We found that this was not only related to high levels of stress more than individual or interpersonal racism, as well as some institutional forms of racism that people were reporting, but this cultural racism was highly related to these, high, to these stressful trauma symptoms. And I think that is interesting as we continue to, to move into a more technologically advanced society. So for me, I think the, these findings and some of the research that we're doing now is moving into the space. So we're really trying to understand what is uh, vicarious racism or cultural racism doing to the mind and body for Black youth as well as for Black adults? So we have all of this imagery. Uh, we have all this imagery in court cases right now that can be really stressful, right? And if we think about the history of Black people, one of the things, one of the strengths of Black communities is collective identities, right? Particularly um, amongst Black women matriarchs, uh, where if somebody is hurt, that is a part of my identity. Um, and when that happens, that collective identity that also has some protective effects can also influence how we experience stress when we see these people who look like me on our TV screen. So when I see someone that looks like me, like Sandra Bland, that can be a really stressful experience. And that can influence how my body is able to regulate itself. We also know that some of the current research is coming out is that Black youth are starting to ask questions, not that they haven't been asking questions since the beginning of time, but about um, what they see on the TV screen around racial injustice. So when George Floyd was killed, um, when we saw Maude Aubrey on our, on our TV screens, things that we can't always turn off. You know, with Facebook, with social media, with Twitter, there is just a lot of imagery that is coming into our spaces that we know can be really stressful and uh, stressful not only for the kid, but having these conversations, maybe earlier than parents wanted to, can also be stressful because in a lot of cases in our focus groups, which I'll say in a second, the discussion is how do I want to protect the beauty of being uh, young and Black and beautiful and protect them from having to have these discussions about racism, but knowing that I wanna protect them from harm and the conversation has to still happen. And so a lot of these conversations are happening and a part of our work has been focusing on thinking about how stress <laughs> from these experiences can influence health outcomes, but also what are ways to have a conversation that are uplifting in ways that build awareness. So we call that racial socialization and builds not only the knowledge for the kid, but also is stress reducing for the parent to feel that they have some autonomy as well as some wellness to be able to talk to their children in the ways that they feel comfortable doing it and in the space that they want to do it in. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the focus groups that I am currently doing. Um, these focus group discussions right now are happening a lot with Black women and these happened um, the quotes that I'm about to show happened right after um, George Floyd was killed. Um, and we're continuing to collect some data um, around these areas. And I won't go into too much detail about some of our findings, but I'm happy to follow up if you have any questions later about some of our current findings as we continue to move forward. Um, one of the things that we talked about was how do you as a Black woman, as a Black man, how do you think about systems perpetuation of racial trauma? How do you consider race, what racial trauma is? How do you experience it in your day-to-day -day life? I just talked about very recently about maternal health and morbidity. 
And I want to touch on some of the quotes that people put down in this specific area, because I think it's important because we don't actually have measures that really truly capture what is happening um, in this process. So one um, woman said, black women in hospitals are treated like black men with the police. There was a study that said black people don't feel pain. We expressed something to our doctor that was ignored. We both know that, that this hospital is known for killing people. I kept telling the white doctor because I had an infection in my finger. I kept telling him something was off about the medication he gave me. And he gave me morphine three times and mixed it with Benadryl. And then it was the black nurse that was like, something's not right with her. He, the white doctor kept saying I was fine. And so I had to be rushed into the CPR room. I honestly felt like I was going to die. A lot of times when we think about um, systems of oppression, I think a big focus of our attention has been on carceral systems and relevantly so, uh, of how perpetuations of race, racial injustice continues to happen. But I think it's uh, important to note, particularly um, for Black people, that this isn't the only system we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about health and wellness. And medical systems and all systems were ingrained and in, indebted into these um, spaces of oppression across our time. And they also are culprits of how we think about how racism works and how it is perpetuating inequity. As we move forward, I, these are the quotes that we had about maternal health, but I also want to focus in the last couple um, of sections that I'm going to talk about is about um, the healing and radical healing process that was also discussed in these focus groups. And so this has led to some of my current research in considering um, what does Black liberation look like that serves both the mind and the body? And so in these conversations and in these focus groups, as well as um, we did some diagnostic assessments with these participants as well to see if people who experience racism could be diagno diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, because we really don't know uh, in the ways that we think. We, we know that racism is linked to a lot of trauma symptoms, but we don't know if racism leads to a diagnosis. And then what does that mean if you do? And so we were having these discussions um, and with some black women, these discussions led to discussions of healing and what happens um, in certain points in time. So one of our discussions and our focus groups um, happened right after um, the Breonna Taylor verdict came in. And if anybody knows um, that verdict was very distressing because there was no charges, you know, really given to really justify what happened to Breonna Taylor when she was killed by the police. And so there was dismay and anger over the grand jury, the grand jury's verdict. Uh, and there were protests that happened for Breonna Taylor. And so a participant said to us in the focus group um, that, you know, I, I, you know, was out here protesting because it, this wasn't right. But I also knew I went to my therapist after. One of the things that I think is important to think about um, is a lot of, as a psychologist, um, knowing that I work within Eurocentric traditions of what therapy looks like. One of the things I found interesting is really thinking about resistance as healing, but also that it doesn't have to be one thing that heals. And so, one of the things that I think participants were really pointing out to me is that healing can be multi-pronged. Healing can include activism as well as therapy. Maybe even if activism causes me to be hyped up in my body regulatory system because I'm mad and I'm you know, legitimately mad for a good reason. But I also can receive healing from having a space that allows me to decompress after I do the needed resistance. And I think that is a needed conversation and where I think the field needs to go and thinking about um, what healing can look like um, when thinking about resistance strategies that Black people use throughout um, our history as well as currently. And so that led me to reading a lot and thinking and considering a lot about radical healing 
um, in the consideration of racial trauma. And so in radical healing as well as liberation psychology. So liberation psychology is its own field um, that is very important to this conversation. But one of the things that I love about um, these theoretical frameworks as well as these propositions to psychologists to liberate um, our minds as well as to help others to feel liberated is how it focuses a lot on holistic practices that focuses on the mind, the body, and the spirit. I think this is really relevant to Black people as spiritual people throughout our history and how this is not separating out the mind and the body. It talks a lot about liberation is for the mind as well as the body. It also has an anti-oppression frame and a strength base. So identifying what strengths um, Black people have already used or currently use to be able to uplift those strategies to combat the nature and insidious nature of racism. One of the things, the qualities that um, is also a part of this framework is ancestral wisdom. I actually think this is one of the most important components of thinking about the future of our field as psychologists is utilizing these ancestral wisdoms that I think we already do um, in some ways, but I think in thinking about mind and body research as well as informing clinical practice, one of the things I find when I consider um, the collective experiences of racial trauma that I just discussed. So what it means to see people that look like you being killed by oppressive symptom, uh, oppressive sy systems like police um, is something that I think we need to think of as like a collective experience. And if we begin to think about the collective experience of police brutality that we see on our TV screens and our tablets and our phones, then we can begin to think that the actual response to that, to think about healing, is likely going to have to be a collective response. So it's going to be, if we're having a collective experience, the, the healing has to be collective as well. And typically, our therapeutic interventions focus on an individual level intervention. And ancestral wisdom talks about the collective practices we have used throughout our time to really combat um, different forms of oppression and really think about surviving and thriving in and of itself as being a, re a way to reimagine what healing can look like. One of the last things I wanna say about um, radical healing and liberation is this really focused on attending to the system and not just the individual. And so as I talked about some of my research early on, we know that racism again is this multifaceted, multi-level experience. And we have to, as providers, as helps, um, as service um, individuals to, we, we have a, um, a calling to be able to attend to systems that perpetuate injustice. So when we know that societal ills are the, are the cause of a number of mental health issues that Black people face, the real meaning of efforts that we need to put forward, and um, some of my work in this area has put forward, is saying that that has to be where we focus. So it can't be only that individual level healing. It has to be a societal healing. And what does that look, look like with the social reckoning? And oftentimes that's gonna be resistance strategies that we utilize from these radical healing frameworks to think about um, how we can combat racism in all of its forms. And so there has been work in this area, area um, and thinking about radical healing frameworks that focuses on a lot of the key components of ancestral wisdom of thinking about what can lead to strength and resilience, including um, uh, critical consciousness. So what it means to have this understanding of your blackness, but also what it means to uh, resist these experiences, resist oppression as well. Having emotional and social support. So one of the things that we have learned from our focus groups and from the black women and now the black men that we have been working with is these collective focus groups are things that people are asking for uh, in spaces. And we know that there are other 
um, emancipation, like other um, services like emancipation circles for Black individuals to have radical healings and discussions of racial trauma. But we also think that there are other um, ways now in our research that we can add to some of these um, radical healing frameworks to really focus on what I study, uh, how to reduce the stress in our bodies more readily um, to heal from these consequences of racism. And also how to have radical hope in the face of all of, of, all of the oppression that we see that is being experienced. And lastly, um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, bounded justice um, in our field of psychology. So Dr. Melissa Curry talks about bounded justice in the field of psychology and how it's impossible to address health equity when the infrastructures underlying them are eroded by racism and historical oppression. And so within the systems that I work in, um, one of the things I feel like is you can feel and you are bounded in the ways that we think about social justice. And so we have to address the infrastructure, the medical system, the, the school systems, the carceral systems, um, the housing systems that really perpetuate um, inequity and not place the burden um, on Black people to heal themselves. I, I saw this quote recently from uh, Dr. Burley who talks about there's an unrealistic expectation for young people to break generational curses while still operating in the system and culture that created the curses in the first place. And so we need to have interventions that consider the multiple layers of racism that could prevent uh, mental and physical health decline. And I think we're moving, I am hopeful that we can begin to uh, continue to think about radical healing for both the mind and the body and ways that we know as both researchers and clinical scientists in my field to really focus on optimal healing. And I think that is something that I have been really interested in because only recently <laughs> how we began to think, you know, 2007 is not that long ago. And that was still a paper that wasn't highly, as highly cited as it should be and thinking about how racism is a chronic stressful stimulus. So it's really recently that we really started to consider in our research literature that can inform uh, practices as well as policies that racism has a similar process to how we think about all other chronic stressors. And now that we're in this space, I think we have to really think critically and take a historical consciousness lens to thinking about what healing can look like. And I really think um, using the ancestral wisdom as well as collective action is gonna be an important contribution to really thinking about health equity. So I'll end with some take home points. Um, Dr. Tama Bryant, um, who is gonna be our future uh, APA president of the American Psychological Association, wrote about racial trauma uh, a very long time ago uh, in 2007. And she talked about how healing is going to require recognition. And I thought that was such a powerful statement to make um, not only in our academic systems, but also in our communities, because a lot of times what I hear is I didn't really think about, you know, racism as really affecting my body in the ways that you, you have shown me it does. And I think that's an important recognition of just like how we think about other stressors that we have day to day in our day to day life. Racism is doing a similar thing and sometimes worse. And so in order to address racial inequities among Black people and communities, we must acknowledge that trauma experiences for, for this, for Black people are rooted in multi-system oppressive, oppressive contexts. If we understand the his, history of racial injustice that influences current practices, we can consider more racially equitable solutions to address racism among Black people. And lastly, given our continued current uh, sociopolitical climate, as well as our US legacy, it is important to think about ancest ancestral wisdom to inform interventions that promote black healing and thriving. So I think these take home points is bring home that one, the mind and body are not separated from each other. And the ways that I have considered struggle, um, approaching research as well as clinical practice, as well as social justice efforts has really come around to thinking about 
listening to Black people at the beginning of, the, uh, of everything that's happening in my work and really thinking about listening to youth, listening to particularly um, Black mothers um, because we know what is happening across generations and really thinking about what the process is happening where they are talking about their strengths, when they're talking about how they have got past racism as well as what things that they have struggled with because of racism as a way to move forward and thinking about racial equity, racial health equity. So that is all I have. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, this has been a, a great uh, chance to talk about some of my work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Carter. <clears throat> Got me all choked up there. <laughs> no, uh, that's that's some very exciting research and real practical information. Uh, in the few minutes that we have left, um, I'll wait. To, I'll see if there's any questions that pop up. Um, but I had a, just a couple of thoughts there. Um, as you talk, I think some for me the most the, the, the most important part of of, of your research is at the very center of it, this idea of there's a connection between mind and body. Uh, and the, that the things that we think, the things that we experience affects us physically, affects our bodies, uh, which then begins to really tell us about uh, the complex of, of hurts that Black people experience. Um, I told people I don't I it's it's no longer a truism that black people don't go to therapy. I have a therapy practice and it's full it's all it's 100% black. Well, 99.5% black. Um which is the good news, but I, I think that 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 what you're putting out here can really inform mental health workers and 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 medical workers so importantly. That's great. I'm wondering, uh, you made me think a lot about uh, some of the work of Franz Fanon. I'm working on an article right now called Reclaiming Franz Fanon, mm -hmm. because he's that as a, a political philosopher, people, people forget that he was a therapist. Yeah. Uh, and he was, he was a psychiatrist at a time when psychiatrists actually did therapy. Right. And he really, his, the emphasis, his emphasis was that social movement can be healing, right? Of course, mm -hmm. Fanon saw revolution as a healing aspect. And so when you talk about some, some of the solutions that you pose, um, not just, you know, community action, dealing with the body, can you talk a little bit more about that, about the importance of social uh, or, or community activity to this healing that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. We actually have, I, I didn't uh, post the papers here, but mm -hmm. some of the work that we're doing here around Grady has been asking, um, uh, Black women and men about how they respond to racism. Mm -hmm. And we get different responses, including, you know, keep it to yourself, right? Um, uh, act. Um, and act can mean a lot of different ways. So acting can mean resistance, acting can mean social support, acting can mean both. And what we're finding uh, with regard to mental health symptoms, primarily right now, is that those who are reporting that they are more active in their engagement, that mm -hmm. moderates the effect between racism and PTSD symptoms. Mm -hmm. So they are more likely to have reduced PTSD symptoms from their engagement and action, which is counterintuitive to some of the work that we see about um, kind of holding stuff in around racism experience, kind of coping um, and letting things go. Um, that I think is something I think is important when we think about uh, action oriented um, areas of healing. And I think Frantz Manon does it beautifully. You're, you're so right. Um, but I also think one of the things like from our focus groups that I think has been interesting that I really am excited to explore more is like these combination strategies mm -hmm. um, that it doesn't have to be one or the other. So like people have a process developmentally. So we have been asking people, you know, we know that racism doesn't happen at one time point. People have been experiencing racism likely since childhood across time. And I had different coping responses because of their experiences of racism that add on to each other. So we have been listening to people, how they discuss like, you know, the first time when I was a kid, 
I didn't know what to do. I went and told my mom what happened or, you know, I was thinking like, maybe this isn't true. And that influenced how I think about when I talk to my friends about it, that's what happened, you know, this influenced how I thought about it as an adult. And then my action, you know, my critical consciousness really affected how I decided to think about my, you know, voting preferences, the way I think about uh, how I want to, you know, be a, a social activist. And so we've been really thinking about, and seek therapy. So we have this kind of like root of thinking about, you know, developmentally, how racism works, how coping with racism works, and how it's not just this, like, you do one thing, like all of these things build on each other and can be combined to think about what's working the best. So one of the things that we're really interested in is oftentimes when we study these outcomes of action oriented or not, we only have one outcome. It's either going to be mental health or it's going to be physical health, not both. And so we're actually studying while people are um, hooked up to some of our blood pressure um, continuous monitors, as well as measures of physiological arousal, what they say they do, how is that affecting their responses in the moment? Like what is optimal health in those areas? Because we really think that there, these multitude of strategies need to be informed by thinking about what's this optimal health that's happening for different people at different points in time for our optimal mental and physical health wellness. Uh, thank you, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I just put out, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the Q&A chat. If not, I got a couple of more. <laughs> um, yeah. you, know, you know, there's a, a with, within mental health, there's this idea of what's called common factors research. Uh, what are the common factors that link across theories of, of therapy, right? What works uh, as opposed to some special therapy working? And one of those common factors, and in, in, uh, I think the research that's most relevant, uh, talks about uh, what's called the placebo factor or hopefulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's important, for instance, in therapy for, for a clinician to be able to instill hopefulness in the person who they're, they're working with. And you talk about this idea of radical hope. And so I'm thinking, you know, so, okay, there's hopefulness. What is, what, when, when in your research, in your work, when you're talking about radical hope, what is, what is radical hope? What, what's, how is radical hope different from hope? Very, so, uh, so I will say that's not my term. <laughs> uh, so that definitely <laughs> comes from, a theoretical underpinning of mm -hmm. kind of liberation psychology. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you're talking about with hopefulness, I began to study that with regard to depression mm -hmm. um, and thinking about those common factors. And when I came across this in uh, the radical healing framework, mm -hmm. a lot of the radical hope discussion is not saying this is like totally different from just being hopeful for your future, but this is kind of saying in the face of things that you are expected that could hurt you and are hurting you, you kind of have a radical reimagining of what your future can hold mm -hmm. and what your future can hold for your people. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, and thinking about, you know, some of my work has also been a suicide, as uh, Black suicide. Um, and also um, a feature sometimes of PTSD is higher suicidal ideation. One of the things that I think about with radical hope that's different from um, traditional thoughts about hopefulness, mm -hmm. um, which is also important, is mm -hmm. this really pinning down that radical hope is not an alone individual perspective. I was, I was thinking about that, that sound like what you're describing is definitely calls for, for community, for a communitarian approach. Yeah. being able to imagine a different world with other people right exactly mm, wow wow yeah that's great um i'm told that we have to make a hard stop at 8 30 so we got to you know maybe for, for for just one more um thing in terms of you know you you raised up uh dr uh DeGry's, uh work in terms of post-traumatic uh slave uh, sort of, I've been having conversations with, with, with colleagues about that 
to, for transparency, I think that the work that you're doing about the trauma that's passed on physiologically and, and emotionally from, from child to mother, it's more convincing actually than what Dr. DeGray talked, which is kind of like, yeah, eh, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I, I have low self-esteem because of slavery. No, you have low self-esteem because somebody's told you all your life that you ain't worth nothing. Right. That's that's different. But even though I do, you know, this idea that, that trauma is passed on, you talked about the Holocaust research that's accurate there. For me, she doesn't do enough, you know, grounding in that. I can, I can agree with that. Yeah. 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 In terms of how do you how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I actually think we needed that work to to be able to think about it from a biological embedding standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think she naming it. Mm -hmm. really helped, I think, a lot of researchers in the field of basic science, sadly, but also in my world of kind of physiological science, began to say like, well, how far back does this go to really think about its current implications for health? Mm -hmm. And I think even though I think it's harder, much harder to study things like self-esteem, <laughs> Uh, passed down across that, you know, um, physiological tolls is actually something we can do and we have done, um, but not as much with enslavement. So I think like looking at other really detrimental um, hate infused, uh, you know, devastations like the Holocaust, it helps us to think about what like enslavement in the same light um, and we have this research of thinking about the traumatic nature of the Holocaust as it rightfully is. Mm -hmm. But then when we, uh, I think we're ripe in the U.S. to begin to, you know, with Brian Stevenson's work, but also in thinking about like all of our histories of place. So mm -hmm. one of my current um, grants that I just um, submitted was actually looking at lynching records in here in Georgia. Mm -hmm and maternal morbidity, right? So thinking about the place of where, how fear works, right? So if I am part of a history where lynching happened, we work with a number of, of um, nonprofits in this area, the discussion around how people have moved that pass from generation, how people move in the same space, how mm -hmm. people decide on who to go to, how that affects your body, Mm -hmm. right? In the place, if you stay in the place across generations, where family have these high lynching records here in Georgia and mm -hmm. county, that affects maternal morbidity rates now. And I yeah. think that's where a lot of our work is saying this goes and we have to start working in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Sierra Carter, we have uh, come up. I'm going to try to be really obedient because I want uh, Dr. Lakita to um, to, to, to know that I'm, I'm following directions. We have to come up against the hard stop. Do you have any just final thoughts before we end tonight? Uh, I, I mean, I just am really excited that I was offered the opportunity to be in this space. Um, I think, you know, I am not, I'm standing on, you know, a lot of giants, right? That have been doing this work. And I, one of the things that I have really wanted to do is identify that there are so many black scholars before me who have allowed me the space to do this work. And I want the community to know <laughs> that we need your help to continue to move thinking about healing forward. Um, and that is where I think I want to go is really listening to people, Black people specifically, um, and thinking about this work and how we can really move towards equity. Um, and that's where I think at the heart of who I am, I want to be. Excellent. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, thank everyone who has been listening in. As I said, this is the last Freedom School uh, lecture for the semester, but we'll be back uh, with a lot more really interesting, informative and empowering uh, lectures in the coming year. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.